No, I wasn't old enough to see any of these bands. So it was all records. Yeah. And that whole era, unlike now, that whole era was all about records and your ears. It's crazy, man. Today, so many people can play well. They've got facility. They know how to do it. They know the proper position. We didn't know any of that because we were only working with ears. We, there's no videos. There was no any visual uh, information you could get. It was all audio. So, man, consequently, we didn't have the best technique like they have now. But our ears were completely better than the musicians today because we had to rely yeah. on our ears. We were like this with the vinyl. Bass guitar was invented in the mid-50s. There's no courses in 1972 for bass guitar. <laughs> in order to continue my music education, I stayed with the clarinet. I right. went to the art school in, in, in Manhattan, played clarinet all through uh, high school and college. But I played bass on the side. So I was learning music theory and all the kind mm -hmm. of you know, how to read music and all that in school. And then I was learning all the other stuff in the street playing in dance bands. It didn't occur to me that, um, that the bass guitar was an inappropriate instrument for jazz. And I was doing bebop gigs with the old bebop musicians in, in Manhattan. And uh, they look at me funny when I walked in there with the bass guitar, you know. But I figured as long as I'm swinging, they'll uh, accept what I'm doing, you know. It's I kept my blind. word. I went out on the road with Lenny for half a year, came back to school. And um, I started getting called for recording sessions. I had done one session for Ralph McDonald, who's a percussionist and he's a producer. He said, can you read music? I said, yeah. He said, don't BS me, man, because um, I'm about to recommend you on these record dates. You got to read music. I said, man, I play classical clarinet. There's no bass line that they can write that's going to be as difficult as some of these yeah. classical pieces. I play. He says, okay, I'm going to call you. About a month later, man, I got a call for a session for a commercial. And within a month after that first date, I was working five days a week from 9 a.m. in the morning till midnight because word of mouth got, got spread and if you're a bass player and you could play like you weren't reading even though you were reading there's only like four or five guys in New York who could do that Will yeah. Lee, Anthony Jackson, Francisco Centeno, Neil Jason those were the guys you know in LA the session musicians they're right. guys with vans who would take their whatever they wanted from one studio to the other and all the studios were on the ground floor so the cartridge guys would just pull up to the you know, to the door and bring, in New York, you couldn't do that. You know, first of all, the cottage guy would never get out of traffic. And then he'd have to go up to the 33rd floor where the studio was. So consequently, New York studio musicians, you found a bass that could do everything. You found right. one bass that's going to get you through everything you need. So most of the guys carried a Fender Jazz bass. Some carried a Precision. And that was it. Because I was a studio guy from really early on, the amp wasn't really a high priority because they were just taking you direct. This guy named Roger Sadowski, and he said, I'm starting to install preamps in some of the guys' basses. I said, what's it for? He said, well, it gives you more control over your sound, particularly if you're going direct. So I said, sure, put it in. So he put this preamp in my bass. And um, I said, how do you, uh, he said, well, to start it off, you know, put it here, put it there, you know, a little more bass, a little less treble. I said, cool. Never touched it again. <laughs> Never turned it off. Didn't even occur to me to turn it off, you know. From that preamp that I had in my bass, I played on like hundreds of records, you know, so people got very familiar with that yeah. sound. The gear, that was it. When I was playing live, it was kind of like whatever I got behind me, you know, as long as it's loud enough for me to hear. Yeah. You know? And I think a lot of young bass players don't realize that uh, if you play in a big pl place, the audience is not hearing your amp. The audience is hearing the big, yeah. humongous speakers on the side of the stage. And the amp is just for you and the musicians in your immediate area. But I wasn't doing a whole lot of live gigs right. because I was in the studio. What happened was I was writing music for guys like Luther and David Sanborn and Miles Davis. And they started inviting me to the mix. And they said, look, you wrote it, you arranged it, come to the mix to make sure this thing comes out the way it's supposed to. And from that point, the next time they say, hey, we need you to produce. You know? right. So it was a very natural progression. And to me, there was not much difference. It was just like you, you wrote the song, you played the instruments, you're helping to mix it. Okay, well, why don't you start like, giving your opinion earlier on in the process? Yeah. So that's how I got into the producing thing. Methods have changed over the last, you know, 25 years. Positives and negatives, you know, like you'd have, a, I remember a couple of sessions, man, with Luther Vandross where me, Yogi Horton on the drums, Doc Powell on the guitar, and Nat Adley over there on the piano, and Luther behind the microphone, and we're just playing. You could just feel us yeah. operating as one mechanism. You know, just coming up on something together. There's no feeling like that. So when we started adding instruments in separately, you lost a little something, yeah. you know? On the other hand, sometimes we couldn't find it. Sometimes the song, you know, the song started off right and then we lost it. You know, now with sampling, it's just be like, hey, take those four bars that y'all started with and loop it and you'll have a good feeling throughout the song.
How many groups do you know when they're together, man, they made a certain kind of music that was incredible. And then when the guys split and made their own records, it's just something missing. You know yeah. what I mean? There's something very human and incredible about collaboration. You know, and I think that uh, that's coming back.